Now, there's a poem written by an unknown author, but he was a genius, or she, whoever they were. And this is the words of their poem. It's short, by the way. To live above with those we love, undiluted glory, but to live below with those we know, quite a different story. (laughs) Isn't that so true? Sometimes it is hard in this life to love people and to get along with people. And yet our message today is that Jesus calls us to be people of great love. Not just people of great love towards God, but people of great love towards one another. That's God's heart. In fact, those things are so connected that in Jesus' mind, they're inseparable. And open up with me to Mark chapter 12 if you haven't yet. And if you don't have a Bible, you can always open it up on your browser, on your phone. It's a good way to do it. Maybe you have a Bible app. And I also encourage you to take notes this morning. If you haven't taken notes before, try taking some notes so you can chew on this later and think through it and really process it because the words we're reading today, they're important for all of us. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28, we'll get the context again. This was from last week's message. Then one of the scribes came. And having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So you guys remember, I'm gonna start my timer before I go any further. Good news for you. First service with the altar call was 27 minutes. That's short. I was tired this morning. I had a snack in between services (laughs) to wake up a little bit, okay? But the, the theme of our study the last four or five weeks has been tried and true. Jesus is being inspected by the religious leaders of all different backgrounds. Some were Sadducees, some Pharisees, some Herodians. This man today is a scribe. And we talked about that a little bit last week. The scribes were the legal experts of the law. If you needed a legal contract written up, they were the ones. If there was somebody working on the application of biblical doctrine, They were the ones. They were entrusted with studying and teaching God's word. So they were experts of the law. And by perspective, many of them were probably Pharisees in their sect. They were very, very hardcore about God's word and what it said. But the scribes have come, and this man particularly, to test Jesus. And that's what's been going on whether it was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're all testing Jesus, trying to find fault with him. And what they didn't know, and we've talked about it often, but they were providing a service, a service that was necessary for a Passover lamb to be accepted for sacrifice. When people brought their sacrifice for the Passover, the priests would look over it, and if it was without blemish and without flaw, then that lamb could be sacrificed in their place. And if you don't know the history of the Passover, it goes all the way back to Exodus, where God's wrath and judgment was passing through the land. But everyone who had the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, spread on their doorway. The wrath of God passed over them, and they did not enter into judgment, but they entered into life. And who's that a picture of? It's Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. He is the fulfillment. He is our Passover lamb. So just as the priest would have inspected the lamb, it was fitting for Jesus to be inspected by all these different religious leaders. And today, in this study, we end that period. This is the last time anyone will question Jesus in his life. 
He's a few days out from the cross. But Jesus is going to be found faultless, without blemish, perfect and holy, ready to be God's sacrifice for our sin. Now this scribe in verse 28 who came to Jesus, we picked up very quickly last week that though he's testing Jesus, he's got a little bit different of a heart. First it said he had been listening to the answers Jesus had given to all the other people that questioned him. He had been listening, which is far more than the other leaders had done. He'd been reasoning, thinking in his own heart. He perceived that Jesus's answers were well. They were true. And so he asked Jesus a question of his own. No doubt to test Jesus. But I also wonder if he wasn't a little bit curious. Some thinks the scribes had been debating this question among themselves because they had taken down 613 laws from Moses' commands. That's a lot of laws. And some think that they had debated among themselves about which one would have been the, the greatest, the first most, the primary, the one that contained the most weight. If you could sum up the law in one law, what would it be? And that's the question he asked Jesus. And we see at the end of our study that it's a question he had been thinking through himself. So though he was here to test Jesus, there's a part of his heart that was more open than the others. I think a piece of him was genuinely listening to the Lord, genuinely listening. And as he listened, he was able to discern God's heart through his word. We're gonna get there at the end. So he asked Jesus, what's the, what's the primary commandment, the first commandment? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So Jesus answered him saying, the primary, the foremost, the weightiest of all, of all the law, the thing that would sum it all up is love God supremely. Love the one true God supremely with the heart, the mind, the soul, and the strength. All these different characteristics touch the human personality. So all that is within me from the deepest, most emotional, most intellectual, spiritual, and physical place of me, parts of me, I'm to love God supremely. That's the first commandment. And you wondered if people didn't want to like start clapping for Jesus. Like, hey, that was well said. You wonder if the scribe wasn't ready to say, that's the answer, but Jesus doesn't stop. He asked for one commandment, Jesus is going to give him two. Because loving God supremely comes with something else. <clears throat> in fact, it's inseparable in Jesus's mind in his teaching. Look what he says. So he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus put these two commandments side by side. Now it's true that the first, the weightiest matter is to love God. But the second is also equally important in God's mind. If you're going to love God, then you're going to need to love people too. They're inseparable. Knowing God and loving God is the primary thing. But that love isn't complete unless it also loves others. Man, that must have been convicting. Does anyone here feel convicted yet? Yeah, I'm convicted because I've been to Winco. <laughs> I've stood in line. I've been to the gas station when somebody left their car and went in to buy snacks. When the sign says, do not leave your car here, right? Sometimes it's hard to love people. We've all had days where we're like, Jesus loves you, bro, and I'm working on it. Sometimes we're like, and I'm trying hard. You better believe me. You just ain't easy to love. We all fall short on this. But this is such a powerful reminder for you and I. 
that we can't actually love God and not love people. We can't. In fact, that's point number one. If you're taking notes today, loving God without loving people is incompatible. It's incompatible. It's not doable. It's impossible. In fact, Jonah, bring up the first slide from 1 John. This is what John wrote about the matter. He said, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. John says, look, if you say you love God, but you don't love people, that makes you a liar. That makes you a liar. You can't claim to love someone you cannot see if you cannot love the people you can. And that's a convicting thought. And I write this question down if you're taking notes with it. I ask, why? Just why? Why is it that way? There's so many people that just want to love God, but we don't want to love people. I feel like God knew what he was doing when he put these two together. Have you ever met someone who's like, oh, I love God. I'm good with God, but man, I can't stand church. (laughs) I can't stand his people. There's something wrong there. Why is that? Well, because when you study the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find out really quickly a couple of things. One, people are the objects of God's love. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? People are the objects of God's love. When we're in the grocery line, I'm like, I can't stand that person. Jesus is like, man, I love them. And I love them. People are the objects of his love. His love so moved him that he came to earth to die for man, to take man's place, rising again to secure their eternal salvation. That was motivated out of love. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. It's not, it wasn't motivated because he was bored. God wasn't bored. God wasn't missing anything. In his triune form, his trinity, God has everything. He lacks nothing. He's complete. But he made people the object of his love. From the moment he created them, he even made them in his own image. So what you find is that God is very others-centered. The most selfless being in the universe is the creator. Isn't that incredible? That's why you and I could never be the creator. It would be all about us. Every other town would have your name on it. It'd be all about you. But God's not that way. God is so caring, so kind, so patient. Yes, it is all about him. Yes, it is all about his glory. It is. And yet, somehow, he's made people like you and I objects of his love. Though we are fallen, though we are broken, he loves us anyways. Guys, that's so convicting. Brett and I had a super cool opportunity um, to last minute book out yesterday and go to a conference and be a part of a conference. And we were talking about the love of God, how it serves people. And I was so convicted from John 13 when it says that Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's how it describes Jesus on the night he was arrested. He loved to the end. Makes you want to cry, doesn't it? And here they were arguing about who's the greatest before dinner. And what's Jesus doing? Full of love. He gets up, takes off his garments, dresses himself as the servant, and starts to wash their feet. Guys, it's powerful. And Jesus taking off his garments to put on the servant garment, it was actually a picture of how Jesus stepped out of his glory in an even greater way. He had already made himself the servant of all. He was just showing them once again. He had already stepped out of his glory in a sense, putting it aside and putting on the veil of humanity, taking on flesh, coming as a servant to love man. Guys, it's a, it's a powerful, powerful message. Remember that this passage is talking about a love issue, not a works issue. It's about greater love, not greater works. But great love will motivate you to do great things won't it? There's a brother in our body who's getting ready for his daughter's wedding. I've seen him going crazy, putting things together for the wedding. 
building gazebos and all sorts of beautiful things with just such masterful work and love. Why? Because great love motivates you to do great things. It's the truth. God is other-centered. And when God calls you and I into a relationship of grace, when he saves us, guess what he wants? He wants his other-centeredness to rub off on you and me. He wants you and I to be other-centered too. That's what he wants. He wants us to love him supremely with all that we are, with our whole heart. And from that place, he wants us to love others as we would want to be loved. That's what he wants. So let's talk about that for a second. What does it mean to love neighbor as self? I think that's a good question. I think you should write it down. What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? You know, I wrote out some thoughts for myself personally. I want to read them to you. on how I wish to be loved when I think about loving neighbor as self. This is what I wrote. Loving self means to put me first, give me preference, give me acceptance, give me validation, believe that I am worth something. It's so weird to me as humans, we, we all believe that we're special, but we don't wanna treat anyone else like they're worth anything. It's so hard, I don't know where that hate comes from but I want to be loved. I want people to think I'm worth something, to treat me with care and dignity, to seek my well-being and not my harm, to put my aspirations and dreams first, to sacrifice on my behalf that I could have something better. And in all of that I wrote down, think of how you would want to be loved, treated, admonished, encouraged, and do that for others. How do you want to be loved? God calls you and I to love others as self. In fact, Jesus makes it clear the very next, or the very end, end of this verse, look what he says. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is it. This is the sum total. This is what the law equals. For all of you who hate algebra, law plus X equals love. I did that equation wrong. I wasn't good at algebra, you can tell. Somebody's like, there should have been a Y and a Z in there. Okay, I apologize. Point number two, though, love is a choice. Love is a choice. You know, I've, I've wrestled with this because God has loved me so much. And God has loved me in a way that I don't deserve. And what does it look like in my heart to choose to love others? to choose it. This is what I do know. Jonah, would you bring up the second slide from Galatians? This is what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's long-suffering. It's kindness. It's goodness, self-faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There it is again. Against such there is no law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And when I'm thinking about choosing to love others, I instantly recognize I cannot do it on my own. I can't. Because when Cody gets to the gas station, he's on the way to see family. It happened on our last road trip. If you're wondering, that was a true story. We got like a four hour drive with a toddler in the car. The last thing I wanted was to sit behind the car and par parked in front of the sign that says no parking at the gas station. But that's where we were at. And my inward inclination is to become angry, frustrated, to get out and tell someone to move their car. But that's not love. So I, I understand that in my own strength, I'm gonna struggle. I need the spirit of God. I need God's help to love people the way he wants me to love them. But this I also know, somehow, God's power, his grace, but there needs to be, I think, a choice on my part to step out in obedience. I don't know how that all works, but there's a choice. I need to choose to love people and let God work through me and produce the fruit of his spirit through me. But God wants me to be a willing participant. I remember a pastor whom I love, 
um, who's really big on marriage and helping people. And it was before I was married. And he said something so powerful to me. He said, you know, some mornings in our marriage, I've woken up and I haven't felt love towards my spouse. If you're not married, you might be like, how's that, how's that possible? If you are married, you go, I, yeah. We've all felt those days where we wake up and we're just frustrated with our spouse. He said, and on those days, I chose to love because love is a choice. And he said, if you choose to love, your heart will catch up with you later. Your emotions will follow your choices. And so I think for you and I, I think there's a place where we got we to put boots to ground. You may feel like, Lord, I just don't feel like loving people. I'm not sure it's always about how we feel. I think by you and I choosing to obey, saying, Lord, I, I choose to love people, you're gonna have to help me do it. Somewhere in there, there's that part where the spirit starts to work through us and produce in us all sorts of life and goodness. And then we find our way, self ministering to people and loving people in a way we didn't know we could because it's Christ in me. So loving one another as Christ has loved us. Love is the primary thing. And for you and I as God's people, it should be prioritized and practiced. In fact, if you want a practical step, you can write down this question. What is governing my choices? What governs my choices? My behavior, my conversations, my worship, my attitude. It should be love. It should be love, all of it. And guys, when we talk about love, we talk about prioritizing love, where people err is they think that you can no longer have truth if you're just gonna have love. That's not the case. There's tough love for a reason. Love can be very truthful. And that's not to be sacrificed. But even if it was a moment of truth where I'm confronting somebody else, the motivation behind that should be love. I always loved what Pastor Mark used to say, when people bump you, what spills over? Is it your flesh? Is it your nastiness, your anger? Is it God's love? Is it God's grace and God's spirit? Love is to govern me in my heart. It's to govern my choices. Just much like the peace of God is to govern his children. So too, I think love is to be our motivator. So love. Jesus would go on to say in Matthew's gospel that love fulfills the law and the prophets. It fulfills the law and the prophets, all of it. If you were to condense the message of the prophets to condense the laws, it comes down to two things. Love God supremely and love others as yourself. That's it. In fact, my personal conviction is I also believe that that kind of love fulfills the human experience. I believe that, that I was made to love God and to love others as God has loved me. And someday when we're all in heaven, guess what's gonna remain? Love. Paul talks about faith, he talks about hope, he talks about love. But he says the greatest of these is love. Because it doesn't matter if I have all hope and all faith or every single spiritual gift. He said, if I have not love, guess what you sound like? Clanging cymbal, and not the nice kind, like John plays on drums. Think more of the child you've raised, if you've raised children, who got the pot out and banged on it for two hours. You know what that's like? And at the very end of two hours, you're just like, ah. that kind of clanging cymbal is what Paul's talking about. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. But the greatest of these is love because someday my faith will be my sight. I will see the Lord face to face. I'll no longer just have, have to have faith in what I cannot see because I will be in his presence. So faith ends. Hope will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ is my living hope and someday I'll live with him. So what remains? Love does. My love for God and my love for people, that's eternal. That lasts forever. That's a piece of me that's gonna go through all eternity. So we better start practicing it now. <laughs> Guys, 
I just want to say, praise God for grace. I already told you my gas station story, but I, I struggle with it. Have I told you the gas station story yet? We were on a road trip. This guy, I can't believe him, okay? Here's the point. We all struggle with it. We all fall short. That's why we need a savior. In fact, Paul would write later in Galatians that the whole point of the law was also to point us to our need for Jesus. Because even though we've condensed the law down to just love God supremely and love neighbor as self, guess what? You and I fall short of that. We fall short of it daily. And it's a reminder to us that I need the love of God. I need the Savior to forgive me, to accept me, to restore me, to transform me. I need his cleansing on my life because I cannot do it alone. I can't. And I wanna, before we go any further, I wanna debunk one lie real quick. Can we debunk a lie this morning? A myth. Because it circles around Christian thought and theology. But there are, there's a perspective that if you just love people, that's enough. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. That if you just love the idea of God or if you just love people, love is the fulfillment of the law, thus you will go to heaven because you love. In fact, books have been written on it. It's not true because you cannot love God supremely if you do not know his Messiah. That's how it works. To be able to love God like he's talking about, you have to accept the messenger whom he sent, which is Christ, his son. You might say, Cody, I don't agree with that. Well, let me show you one thing real quick, right here. Verse 32, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, this scribe, he understood something. Now, by the way, we're putting a pin in that idea of knowing Jesus. We're not done with it. Just hold it there for a second. Because it actually connects to this scribe's life. This scribe heard what Jesus said about love about loving God supremely, about loving others. And he looked at Jesus and he said, that's the truth. Well said. He had a different heart than a lot of the other critics of Christ. He was genuinely listening. And then we see from his answer that he had been thinking over it himself. Look at verse 33. To love him with all the heart, all the understanding, all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more, the whole, more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. That almost sounds blasphemous. But he looked at Jesus and he goes, to love God and love people is greater than all of it. Because this scribe had come to recognize that at the heart of all of God's commandments, God doesn't want empty religion. God wants loving relation with people. That's what God wants. He wants loving relationship with people where people are in a right relationship with him and a right relationship with others. That's what God wants. Not empty religion. And he understood that. And Jesus looked at the scribe and he gave them this incredibly peculiar answer. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. He wasn't far, but he wasn't there yet either. Something was missing this scribe had rightly deduced God's heart and the understanding of God's heart behind the commandments. But he didn't have an, a right understanding of God's Messiah. He didn't. That's what he was lacking. What he was lacking was a personal relationship with God that could only come through knowing the Savior. And when Jesus ended this speech with him, it said nobody else dared to question him. And next week, we'll get in together the questions that Jesus has for them. But guys, that's our, that's our third point. Knowing Jesus saves. That's what saves you. You guys remember a couple weeks ago, I told you something. I said, a loving relationship with God starts with knowing God. It starts with knowing him. Love is the continuation of that. But at some point, 
all of us, if you want to walk with God, you have to start by surrendering your life to him. And worship team, come on up. That's where we're going to close this morning. We get to take communion together. I'm excited for it. And the ushers are going to come around in a second. But as we're wrapping this up, I think there's application for you and I. I think there's action. God doesn't want empty religion. God doesn't. God wants loving relation. And for you and I who are God's children, who, have, who know the Lord, God wants you and I to walk in love. Love towards him supremely, love towards others. And it starts in our heart. And I think as Justin leads us out in worship and as we take communion together, it's a chance for us to sit before the Lord and say, Lord, what's, what's governing my heart? Am I loving you today? Or am I loving something else? You know, I believe that if there is little to no love towards others as well in our hearts as Christians, something is wrong. It's a chance for me just to evaluate my heart and say, God, do I love others? And if God touches that spot in my heart and I go, there's actually people I don't love, I need to ask myself, what is that, Lord? Something has gotten wrong. Something has gotten off and I need to get it right with you. Maybe they've wounded you and you need to forgive them. Maybe there's something painful that you need to let go of. I don't know, that's between you and the Lord. But I think there's chance for us to examine ourselves before God and just say, Lord, am I loving people the way you want me to? But I also think there's opportunity for those here today or maybe you're on our live stream and you don't know the Lord Jesus yet. And you hear us talk about a God who's so loving that he would give himself on our behalf. You hear us talk about a God who's so loving that he would forgive a person for all their sin, all their wrongdoings. A God who's so loving that he would give his life that you could experience life in abundance, both now and eternally. And maybe you're wondering, what does it take to be loved by a God like that? Surrender. Receiving the Messiah whom he sent. Paul made it real easy. He said, it's just confessing with the mouth what I've come to believe in my heart, that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the son of the living God, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again to save me. And it's that confession of faith and calling on his name, that's what saves a person. And if you're here this morning and you've never done that, but you want it, today's your day. Today's your day to just look up between you and Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, Save me. Save me, Lord. That's it. That's it. Let's pray together, guys.